Well, so we've got uh, four theological mistakes to, um, to chew through, and there is a particular order to them. I'm starting with the doctrine of God, with problems that evangelicals have in their doctrine of God. And I really want to see that there is a real order here. It's important that we start with the doctrine of God because in any system, it is what you do with, with what is most foundational in Christianity, that is the doctrine of God, that will drive everything. So I, I'm not going to be driving this question into ethical issues very concretely, though we will get there. But this all works through into ethical issues, and I'd like you to be thinking that way. Who God is shapes the very nature of Christianity, shapes the nature of the salvation that we enjoy, of the gospel that we share. Who God is is determinative for everything Christians think and do. But here's the problem. Christians are not being as explicitly and intentionally Trinitarian as they really should be. And this is given away simply when you see Christians share their faith. What is it you expect to hear when Christians share their faith? They'll talk about the cross, they'll talk about God's free offer of salvation, but when they say the word God, the word God often isn't unpacked as if we'll all roughly, correctly assume uh, what the word God means. And so Christians today are waxing lyrical about the beauty of the gospel, but not so much about the beauty of the go God whose gospel it is. And therein lies a profound problem. For not only then are we failing to distinguish the glory of the triune God from the glory of idols, but we are losing, we are letting slip through our fingers the very glory of this God in all his beautiful distinctness. Let me just show you a little bit of what that is. <laughs> See, as soon as Christians try to get Trinitarian, I, I think uh, <laughs> there are a few problems they wade into that put them off ever trying to be Trinitarian in the first place. So either Trinitarian language becomes extraordinarily abstract, which will appeal to some people and not to others. So what's the Trinity? The Trinity is like a big heavenly boogie. It's a big heavenly conga, and you can join the divine dance. And there's something that's right to that heavenly community that we're brought in to share. But it's, it's so abstracted from what we see in Scripture that it, it can become its own abstract problem before too long, while there are benefits to it. Probably more commonly, the problem people slip up on is that as soon as we start talking about the Trinity, in popular circles anyway, what do you hear about? The young Christian says, please, can you explain the Trinity? And we're into, oh, the Trinity's like H2O. Oh, dear. <laughs> Not only is it heresy, because that's modalism, uh, God just has three different moods or modes that he um, warms in or cools out of. Um, God is this one stuff, H2O, and can appear in three different modes. Um, or, or you get even worse, don't you? get the shamrock leaves, um, streaky bacon, eggs, all that kind of stuff. But in... Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you've heard it, haven't you? Um, but Christians don't believe in the Trinity because they sense their God's eggishness or leafishness. It is because, well, John 20, verse 31. John says he writes these things, he writes his gospel, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that is, the anointed one, the one anointed with the Spirit, the Son of God. So an invitation to... A simple faith in Jesus is an invitation to a Trinitarian faith. You're invited to know the one who's anointed with the Spirit, who is the Son of his Father. Getting into a Trinitarian faith is not stepping away from a simple faith in Jesus. Far from it. It is pressing into who Christ is. 
Now, here's why you lose the glory of God, the very beauty, the winsomeness, the attractiveness of God if you lose Trinity. What does it mean that God is triune? What sort of God are we talking about here? Well, it means that this Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is one who can say in John 17, 24, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. That's what this God has been doing for eternity. The Father has been loving the Son, pouring out the Spirit of his blessing on him. Now, that means because God is a trinity, we can say God is love. You can only say God is love because God is a trinity. A single person God, which is the sort of God Christians will default to if they're not explicitly Trinitarian, a single person God who's been by himself for all all eternity cannot be essentially loving by definition because he's been eternally solitary. Only the triune God can be eternally loving. Only of this God can John write, God is love. And that means that the glory of this God is at complete odds with the nature of the glory of all other gods. And so when we speak of this God seeking his glory, that is not a selfish thing with this God, because his very glory is a self-giving thing. The Father finds his very identity. Jesus says, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. The Father finds who he is, he is Father, in loving, giving life to, eternally, his Son. That's who he is. One who pours out life and love. And so the glory of this God is an outshining, giving, generous thing. And that can only be the case with this God. Only a God who's eternally been loving can have this sort of glory, which is why you get to see descriptions of this God's glory in Scripture are they always have a communicative, a, uh, sorry, you can tell I'm an academic trying to speak English. Um, They have a a, a generous sharing quality to them. God's glory in scripture is a radiant, diffusive thing. And so we see, for example, the glory of the Lord shone around the shepherds that night outside Bethlehem. The glory of the Lord is constantly referred to as a radiant, shining out thing. The heavenly city does not need light of lamp or sun or moon, for the glory of God gives it light. That's the nature of this God, where all other, where single person gods must be instinctively needy, sucking in, taking, wanting our worship. This God is full to overflowing and shares. Uh, just think about it. Imagine you are solitary for eternity. Imagine you're God for a moment. You've probably done it before. Imagine you're God. You've been absolutely solitary for eternity. Why would you have a creation? Why would you do it? Yeah, maybe some, for some amusement, have some slaves, have some friends. Yeah. It's, it's, it's either loneliness or weakness. It's a lack. So the, the, the solitary person God is always motivated by a self-gratification, by a need, by a lack. The glory of such a God is like a black hole. So the very glory of God must be entirely different given the nature of who the God of the Bible is. And so it's not just in the face of pluralism today. Um, Think, for example, the Wheaton controversy, um, where a Wheaton professor was saying that uh, um, Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Not only is that threat around, 
um, that the God of the Bible might be equated with another God. But simply for the enjoyment of who this God is, if we're not clear on the identity of God, we lose his very nature and beauty. And that's going to then affect the shape of what gospel he'd offer. I mean, a single person God is, is not going to offer the blessings of adoption. A God who's not a father cannot offer adoption. Only the triune God can send his son, unite us to his son by his spirit, and bring us in his son to himself as children. Only the triune God can do that. You lose that great benefit of salvation if you lose who our God is. Second, the second, from do doctrine of God to doctrine of who we are. What does it mean to be human? And so many ethical questions flow out of this one. What does it mean to be human? One of the most beautiful prize flowers of Reformation thought is the first question and answer of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And this distills a vast amount of biblical thought into one gorgeous question and answer. Here it is. Question is this. What is the chief end of man? What is the purpose, the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Well, this is eternal life, John 17, 3. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Now, this, I think, is something that is, again, far too neglected in evangelical presentations of the gospel and evangelical belief. And let me give a personal testimony here. I found myself many years ago reading Jonathan Edwards' Religious Affections. And when I was reading Religious Affections, he goes through various signs of the hypocritical Christian and, and of the true Christian. And as he's describing the hypocritical Christian, he says, the hypocrite does desire the gifts of God, such as salvation, more than God himself. And as I read that, I thought, you got me. But while I felt bad about it, I thought, but that's what I was taught. I was brought up to believe Jesus gets you out of hell to buy you heaven. And so what I was brought up wanting, the reward of the gospel, I was taught, unless I really misheard it, the reward of the gospel as I was taught it was heaven, salvation, and an abstract blessing which is very different to what you see, for example, in Philippians 1 with what Paul says his desire is. He says, my desire is to depart and not be in heaven, though he would be. He says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Because for Paul, heaven would not be heaven without Christ. And this, I think, we need to recover. And if we do, much that is problematic in evangelical circles will be undone. And I think, for example, of the evangelism-discipleship split that happens in many churches, where basically what happens is this. The evangelist says, hey, look, we, a holy God is going to judge all sinners. So all sinners who don't repent will go to hell. So you can go to hell, or Jesus has died for you so that you can get heaven. And by the way, this heaven is completely free. 
So you just trust, accept this free gift, open empty hands, accept this free gift, and it's yours. Heaven can be free for you right tonight. And anyone in their right mind goes, well, yeah, thank you. I don't want hell, I want heaven for me because I want good things for me because I love me. So yeah, I'll go for the heaven, please. Tick. And it's free. <laughs> Excellent. I like this. And then they come along the following week to the discipleship class and the pastor very meanly talks about Jesus' call for holy living. And this new be believer says, well, hang on, you told me last week it was completely free. So what are you now putting this extra burden on? This is a complete catch. It's not free. There's holiness. But that's because I sold an abstract understanding of salvation in the first place. Instead, as a preacher, I should offer Jesus Christ and him absolutely freely. Have him have Jesus Christ, know him, walk in his ways, which are the ways of freedom and liberation, and you will know and enjoy life. And then the next week, when we're talking about um, how our lives are going practically, and I see this person struggling with sin, and I can say, my brother, my sister, why in enjoying that sin are you walking away from the salvation to which you are called? Jesus' salvation. I'm not offering an abstract thing. And it's all down to what we're made for. We are made not to leave earth and simply go to enjoy heaven or paradise or some abstract blessing. We are made to love the Lord your God with all your heart. We are made to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We are made to know him. It's really a simple understanding of humanity that flows out of a basic God-centeredness. God is the reward of the gospel. And that means that as we think about the gospel, as we proclaim it, we need to be very clear that we're making God the reward showing people the beauty and, yes, the glory of this triune and marvelous God. He is the reward. From what we're made for, what is the human problem? And here I see again evangelicals uh, profoundly lightening the nature of the human problem with disastrous pastoral effects. And let's have a look at some of what they are. So we're made in the image of God to delight in God, to love him, to love one another. So that's what we're made for. What then went wrong in the Garden of Eden? What is the essential problem of sin? Now, sometimes people say it's that Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They did what they were commanded not to do. Now, that's true, absolutely, but it doesn't actually plumb deep enough as to why they disobeyed. And it's good to go underneath the act of disobedience to appreciate the motivation, because then you get a deeper understanding of what sin is. And what happened in the sin was not simply that for some reason their wiring went wrong and they made the wrong choice. No, there was a deep motivation in the choice. And it wasn't that they stopped loving. It wasn't that Adam and Eve were created to be lovers of God, lovers of each other, and that they then became haters and non-lovers. No, no. All humans are lovers. The question is, what do they love? And in Adam and Eve, their love turned. This is why the Apostle Paul, when he writes of sinners, he describes them as lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. That's the problem with sin, that the love 
we just love as humans and we are made to love God. That's where health and happiness is found. But the problem of sin is that the direction of our affections and desires and loves has turned towards other things than God. And you see this if you look at um, Genesis 3 verse 6. Why is it that Eve takes the apple? Why does she do it? Because she sees it is desirable for gaining wisdom, apparently. Sin has got a hold on her because it's drawn her desires, her affections, what she wants. And so the human problem is deeper than her actions. It is deeper than outward disobedience. Her act of sin is just a manifestation of a deeper turn in her heart. She now desires the fruit more than she desires God. And this, says James in James 1, is how it is with all sin. James 1 verse 14 and 15, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Or Ephesians 2, we, we used to walk in the desires of the flesh. That's our problem. It's a deep orientation of what we want is the problem. Now, to illustrate how this rolls out, why it's so important in everyday Christian living to get this, I want to introduce you to a debate between Martin Luther, the reformer, and Erasmus, the great Renaissance scholar. Because Martin Luther believed that this very issue was at the heart of the Reformation and therefore at the heart of all he was fighting for in terms of pastoral benefit in the Reformation. This was the issue he believed. Let me explain a little bit. Erasmus believed that our basic problem as humans is that we are just a bit weak-willed and lazy. And so we ought to be holy but can't be bothered. What we need is to pull ourselves together and try a bit harder. Right? Our problem is basically spiritual laziness. And he wrote a book in 1524 called The Freedom of the Will, putting that to Martin Luther, suggesting that Luther had been just a bit strong in how he spoke of sin and so on. The next year, Luther usually didn't pay attention to many of the criticisms that were fired at him. He would just throw them away, or worse. And um, this time, because it was Erasmus, he wrote a response called The Bondage of the Will in 1525. Now, that phrase is unfortunate in so many ways. Um, the Bondage of the Will is a phrase that's commonly misunderstood because people think, well, the bondage of the will, that doesn't make sense or fit with my human experience because I always do what I want. I do what I want, so my will seems remarkably free. I do what I want. So my will does not seem to be in slavery of any sort. But that's not what Luther meant. Luther was saying, exactly, you do always do what you want, but here's the thing, you cannot choose what to want. You always go for what you want, but you don't actually have the kind of level of control. To, you can choose to act differently, but you can't choose to desire differently. We're not wired like that. So, for instance, if for supper later, I could offer you a bowl of delicious soup 
or a bowl of sewage, there is one of them that you want and one of them that you don't want. And for as much as you might want to prove me wrong, you can't change your desire for one of them and your hatred of the other, right? And your choices will follow your strongest desire. And if your desire to prove me wrong is stronger than your desire to avoid sewage, then you'll eat the sewage. But it was still your desire driving you. You wanted to prove me wrong. It's always your desires that will drive your choices. And so we freely choose to do the things we want, but we will never naturally choose God because we don't naturally want him. We want to run away in sin. And this was Luther's experience. He saw, no, my problem is not that I'm just weak-willed and I need to try harder. In fact, he'd spent years trying harder. He'd spent years of extreme ascetic um, behavior. And he said after that, I did not love, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. All his efforts to buy God off had actually drawn him to hate God more. And so he could have he could achieve an outward appearance of righteousness, but it would just be a hollow sham. It would be self-worship, self-righteousness. What Luther began to see he needed was a radical renewal where what he wanted changed. Where it wasn't just that he was being told, try harder, try differently. He began to see that the very orientation of our hearts is away from God, that we love ourselves, we love pleasure, we love money. I just don't love God, and therefore I'll never choose him. And so what I need is for my eyes to be opened by the revelation of God, and so my heart to be turned, so I begin to see, oh, he is actually more desirable, more delightful, more beautiful than those things I'd spent my life chasing. Only when our eyes are open like that and our hearts are turned, then do we see a radical change in us. Now, that difference between Luther and Erasmus could look a bit obscure, perhaps, but it actually meant that they had two different visions of Christianity. And we need to be clear on this today if we're to uh, have the liberation that Luther enjoyed. See, for Erasmus, just try to think how it would be. If, imagine, I, I don't know if you're a pastor or not, but imagine you're a pastor and you know that your problem, uh, the, the, the problem of your people is that they're just lazy. They ought to be holy, but their problem is they can't be bothered. What are you going to do with them? Their problem is they're lazy. They need to try harder. How are you going to pastor them? Tell them to try harder. Make them try harder. And so Erasmus' light view of sin actually leads to a hectoring, bullying kind of pastor. And so Erasmus, for Erasmus, the most basic image of the church um, was that the church is like an army. Uh, so one of his best known works was entitled The Manual of the Christian Soldier. So the important thing for the Christian is keep the rules, do, do your duty. Um, so let, let me read you just a little bit from The Manual of the Christian Soldier. And, and Get how subtle this is. It's not just about externals. Erasmus is very subtle here. He says, Of what use is it to be sprinkled on the outside by holy water if you're filthy within? No devotion better pleases Mary than the imitation of her humility. Would you please Peter and Paul? Well, emulate the faith of the one and the charity of the other. And thereby you'll do better than if you make ten pilgrimages to Rome. Would you imitate St. Francis? 
As it is, you are arrogant, avaricious, contentious, and so control your temper, despise money, overcome evil with good. Hmm. So Erasmus urges his readers to be more humble, more charitable, more self-controlled. But have you noticed? None of that is at all the same thing as knowing and loving God. So behavior and character are what mattered for Erasmus. A relationship with God does not feature in his 22 rules for the Christian soldier. It's just very revealing. For Luther, on the other hand, the church is first and foremost like a family. Knowing God the Father is what matters above all. And so sin here for Luther is not just dereliction of duty, substandard behavior. The act of sin has its roots in the heart's desire and adoration. Now, when played out in church life, those differences become very obvious. Let's take Erasmus, first of all. If right behavior is the goal, and a goal everyone can achieve because they just need to pull their socks up, well, then the church can run like an army. Pastors can serve as the sergeant majors, drilling their troops into line because everyone is capable of getting into line. But if we're made for a deeper purpose to love, glorify, and enjoy God, if we're made for that, and yet, if we cannot do so because our hearts are turned against him, if we're actually enslaved to sin naturally, then merely to order people to do what they can't is cruel. In other words, anyone who comes to hold Luther's deep view of sin, it may initially sound pessimistic, <coughs> actually it means your compassion leaps forward. Because when you have this view of sin, you realize people aren't just a lazy lot. You've got people who are helplessly addicted. You've got people who can't simply sort themselves out. They need the one thing with the power to liberate their hearts, which is the gospel. It, listen to Luther here. He said, how can a work please God if it proceeds from a reluctant, resisting heart. You, you, you know, you, you help 20 grannies cross the road, it looks good for everyone else, and yet you're thinking, oh, I hate having to do this. Is that pleasing to God? No, he said, to fulfill the law is to do its works with pleasure and love. And this pleasure and love is put into the heart by the Holy Spirit. So if hearts that are enslaved to the lies of sin are to be one to God, the glory of God in the face of Christ needs to be made known to them. Christ needs to be shown to be better, more desirable, more glorious than our sin. So compare Erasmus' stern counsel to this from Luther. Luther says, look here, this is how you cultivate faith in Christ. Faith springs up and flows from the blood and wounds and death of Christ. He says, if you see that on the cross, God is so kindly disposed towards you, he even gives his own son for you, then your heart will grow sweet and disposed towards God. You can't simply hector or order people out of their sin. You can possibly bring about behavioral change that way, but you're only going to reinforce a deeper self-dependence. No, ears need to be open to the message of Christ and him crucified. Hearts, therefore, turned at that deep radical level. I'm going to keep going, if this is all right, before opening up to any questions, um, by looking very briefly at the nature of salvation and particularly grace. So we've looked at God, man, sin, and salvation. Now, to understand the problem that evangelicals have with their understanding of salvation or grace, 
Can I just take you back to medieval Roman Catholicism because we've got something similar happening today. In medieval Roman Catholicism, um, here's how salvation worked. It was, as Erasmus said, our problem is we're lazy, just can't be bothered. So God will save those who are holy. And we know that, but we think, oh, do I have to? I just can't be bothered to be holy. And so what happens is God gives this thing called grace, which is kind of like a, a spiritual can of Red Bull. So you can't be bothered to be holy, but the priest, through the sacraments, gives you Red Bull, and you tank back this can of grace, and suddenly you start feeling, right, okay, I'm ready to be holy now. And so by grace, you've been transformed to want to be holy. The verse classically used was Romans 5.5. 5. God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit he's given us. And so God gives us this energizing grace that enables us to become holy and therefore worthy of heaven. Now, this, by the way, was why you might hear um, Roman Catholics would pray, Hail Mary, full of grace because it's like she's completely wired with this grace. She's completely tanked up with grace, and so she's just very, very eager to be holy. Now, that might sound, uh, it's, it's all, this is 16th century Roman Catholicism, but hopefully it doesn't sound too disfamiliar, because grace today is still spoken of as this abstract package of blessing. Even when grace is unpacked in evangelical circles, a classic one would be, what is grace? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expenses. And that's true. It, it, there's something right in that statement. But again, it can make it sound like God gives this stuff called grace. Grace, as the Reformers spoke of it, is not some stuff. It's a shorthand way of speaking of how God in his kindness gives us himself. So the image that Martin Luther liked to use was not Red Bull, surprisingly, but he used the image of marriage. Grace is rather like marriage that a husband and a wife, they swap their status. The wife gets her husband's status. The husband gets the wife's status. And so we, the sinner, gets Christ's status by entering into this spiritual union with him. And so Luther said, Christ is full of grace, life, salvation. The soul is full of sins, death, damnation. Now let faith come between them, and sins, death, and damnation will be Christ's, while grace, life, and salvation will be the soul's. For if Christ is a bridegroom, he must take upon himself the things which are his bride's. Everything I have I share with you, all I am I give to you. He must take upon himself the things which are his bride's and give to her the things that are his. And if he gives her his body and his very self, how shall he not give her all that is his and take all that is hers? And so there's a very different understanding of grace here. Rather than an abstract blessing, here is God giving himself. Again, it's this God-centered understanding of the gospel. Now, because grace became an abstract thing in Roman Catholicism, one of the charges that Roman Catholic theologians threw out at the Reformers was, well, look, if you say we're saved by grace alone, 
what possible motivation is there for people to live holy lives? Right? If you've got heaven for free, what, why am I going to live a holy life? It's as if people are given this abstract thing called salvation. But if I'm given Christ, as we saw, then the Christ I trust in, who gives me his righteousness, is the Christ who will transform me. I cannot walk with him, know him, enjoy him, but be changed. In the 20th century, surrounded by a people that had so easily capitulated to Adolf Hitler, Dietrich Bonhoeffer felt that a wrong attitude towards grace was to blame for that um, mass apostasy. And on the eve of the Second World War, he wrote a scolding attack on what he called cheap grace. He said this, cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Grace alone does everything, they say, and so everything can remain as it was before. All for sin could not atone. The world goes on the same old way and we're still sinners. Well then, let the Christian live like the rest of the world. Let him model himself on the world standards in every sphere of life and not aspire to live a different life under grace from his old life under sin. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. That phrase is the key one, grace without Jesus Christ. Grace without Jesus Christ was exactly what the reformers stepped away from and exactly what we must step away from today. Because the reformers, with their message of grace alone, they're not offering more stuff. They're offering the Christ who transforms. So Luther said, through faith in Christ, Christ's righteousness becomes ours, all he has becomes ours, or rather, he himself becomes ours. No one can receive the Christ who justifies without receiving the Christ who makes holy. True grace is never grace without Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul can say that it is the grace of God that appears training you to holiness. Holiness. 